So first of all, welcome uh, uh, to everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening for yet another stimulating talk about sound. So um, first of all, we just want to acknowledge that the Sound Studies Institute is part of the University of Alberta and located on Treaty 6 territory, uh, which is a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Diné, Ojibwe, Inuit, and many others. SSI is committing to, committed to ensuring that those histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. And I just want to welcome everyone here tonight. Um, so for those who might be <coughs> attending for the first time uh, this evening, um, the Sound Studies Institute is a research institute at the University of Alberta that supports research and creative activities that centralize sound in some way. Uh, we're here as a cheerleader for this work, offering researchers opportunities to work collaboratively, to discover new areas of convergent inquiry, to benefit from collective administrative and technical support, and we provide a kind of a philosophical and physical uh, locus for sharing, exploring, and celebrating collaboration and innovation across disciplines. All right, and now for, for tonight, uh, for tonight's talk, Soundscapes of India, um, uh, I'm really excited to have Alexis Bagat here. Um, this event, uh, uh, Alexis will discuss um, the sound art installation, Listen, My Heart and the Whispers of the World, uh, a collection of audio compositions that reflect on the soundscape of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, the works uh, were presented at the Block Museum in Chicago in a darkened cinema hall um, and uh, using a 5.1 surround sound playback system, uh, and, uh, but with no projected images, just sound. So sort of cinema for the ear. Curators Alexis Bagat and Laurent uh, Rosati uh, describe the experience of Listen My Heart as one in which the cinema screen is a window for shared dreams. Our soundscape program begins high in the Himalayas at the sacred shrine of Muktinath, and from there follows the water of the uh, Yumana as it flows to the plains. Selections included Michael Northam's uh, mnemonic debris aggregates, Hildegard Westerkamp's Into the Labyrinth, and um, Ian Armstrong's Anam, uh, Annapura Pastoral 100 Springs. Um, Alexis Bagat is a writer um, operating in the art world. Prior to 2007, he was a practicing sound artist, and his works included sound installations, tape collages, and radio broadcasts. Uh, in 2007, an Atlas of Radical Cartography, a book project conceived and co-edited with artist Liz Mogul, spun off from an art exhibition that traveled to over 20 cities where Bagat organized intergenerational dialogues on the past and future of maps and the meaning of pictures of the earth in the digital age. Uh, alongside the itinerary of an atlas, he created a pop-up sound in, uh, exhibitions in some empty storefronts, lectured on sound art in Canada, India, Japan, and across the USA, and started an organization called Audience, dedicated to presenting sound art in movie theaters with curator Lauren Rosati which just sounds like a really fascinating um, way to do that. I'm really happy to hear more about that. Uh, Gott currently lives in New York's Hudson Valley, uh, where he's completing a book called Politics and Other Worlds, Works, and he works as the director of the Albany Public Library Foundation and organized readings with the St. Rocco's Poetry Collective. So um, I'd like to, maybe at this moment, we can all unmute for a minute and just clap and welcome Alexis here. Um, and then actually you probably can't do that, but <laughs> quite yet. And then we'll just, I'll just turn it over to him. So welcome, Alexis. Uh, we're happy to have you here. Thank you, Scott. It's wonderful to be here. Um, and, um, yes, I'm, I'm going to be talking about List in My Heart. I guess I should just get the screen share started, right? So let's do that. And then you will see, you can see this slideshow now. Thank you. Okay, great. So yes, I am uh, Alexis, and I'm going to talk about uh, an exhibition called List in My Heart, which was in, uh, which presented at the Block Museum in 2016. It actually premiered in February 2013 in Delhi, which is quite a while ago, but it's also fresh because um, the story of List in My Heart appears in this new book, um, Indian Sound Cultures. Indian Sound Citizenship, which just came out this year from uh, University of Michigan Press. So I'll talk more about that chapter. And I've been thinking about the show this year. So, oh, and there's the book. Yeah, so um, chapter 12 is where Lauren and I tell the story of Listen My Heart. 
So the whole idea of audience and of this exhibition list in my heart is that around the world, there is an entire network of standardized auditoriums with built-in multi-channel sound and they serve popcorn. And uh, Audience, the organization that Laura and I created was dedicated to exploring um, movie theaters as uh, a site for sound artists to present their work where artists could come and just press play, um, especially sound composers who are working with tape music, electroacoustic music, who didn't have to think about bringing in the speakers and setting up uh, like the complete audio system for the presentation of their work. How could they think about a system that you could just plug right into? So I'm just gonna read from the chapter um, mostly for about a half an hour and then we're gonna play some works and then I really can't wait to have questions and answers with all of you. So in 2006, Lauren and I formed audience. This is slide. Oh, there we go. This is, you know what? I have Scott. I re just realized that I have slide numbers written on my chapter notes. <laughs> I don't know what numbers any of these slides are. <laughs> so anyway, I will just say that this is an image here of um, the open window at Color by Henri Matisse, and um, this was kind of the emblematic image that we used for "Listen, My Heart." <laughs> but anyway, that will come. So in 2006, Lauren and I formed Audience, a New York-based nonprofit organization to explore the multi-channel sound environment of the cinema as a new presentation context for works by emerging and established sound artists, musicians, composers, and filmmakers. While the movie theater had not yet been explored as a venue for contemporary sound art, its origins as a site for listening date to the beginnings of cinema itself. From late 19th century Nickelodeons to early 20th century movie palaces to the Dolby equipped theaters of today, cinemas are more than a place to simply watch movies. They are also exquisite places to listen. They've become the perfect concert halls for the century of electronic instrumentation, modular synthesis, digital sound recording, and telepresence. So audience was, oh, and this is the interior of a theater in New Delhi. Audience was conceived in response to an invitation from the Koj International Artists Association in Delhi to present a group show of sound art in that city. For acoustic reasons, it was decided that this exhibition would take place in a movie theater. The path to open up the cinema as a venue for sound art for both artists and audiences was marked by obstacles, financial, technological, and institutional. It would actually take seven years for Lauren and I um, to be able to present this program of sound art in India, which was a program we eventually called Listen My Heart, after a line from Rabindranath Tagore's poem, Stray Birds. While Listen My Heart succeeded at last in creating an opportunity for artists to present work in cinemas, a standard technical platform with a built-in audience, the challenge of presenting sound art in movie theaters, which audience continues to explore, highlights the numerous barriers erected by the cinema industry. This was the uh, theater entrance on the opening night of Listen My Heart. So the term, oh, well, that'll come up in a minute. The term sound art was coined in 1983, <clears throat> but the forms that it describes have a longer history with roots that blossomed in fits and starts throughout the 20th century in text sound, sound poetry, in sound sculpture and conquest, in Neuhorspiel and the public artworks of Max Neuhaus. From the intermedia revolution of the 1960s to the new media revolution of the 1990s, these traditions developed as separate branches with distinct hierarchies and concerns. Then, when inexpensive digital recorders made for recording sounds outside the studio appeared on the market in the 1990s, thousands of enthusiastic phonographers set out into the world with an instrument that was much smaller and much lighter than all previous devices, capturing sounds free of tape hiss and the noise of any recording apparatus. There was an explosion of new sonic work, and during this time, it became convenient to speak of any work that was not strictly in its concerns as sound art. There's more to the story here that I'm gonna skip down upon, but we will get to codes then. So, three, one, three, two, okay. So founded in 1997 an, as an annual workshop and growing into a year round residency center based in Delhi, the coach 
International Art Association has played a central role in the development of experimental and disciplinary art practices in India. In the mid 2000s, Koj became focused on sound art, following a persistent interest in it among Koj's artists in residence and an explosion of sound themed art exhibitions in Europe and Asia around the turn of millennium including Sound as Media at the NTT Intercommunication Center in Tokyo in 2000, Sonic Boom at the Hayward Gallery in London also in 2000, Sonic Process at the MACBA in 2002, and others. Wishing to provide a broad introduction to this art form to audiences in India, Pooja Sood, the director of Koj, invited me to curate a sound art group show at the APJ Media Gallery in New Delhi, where Sood was also the curator. There's the, oh, so the lower right hand picture there is the APJ Media Gallery. Um, APJ is a 2000 square foot modern art gallery described on its website as an abstract glass box designed primarily for projections and light based works. Its open transplant floor plan encouraged focus on obstructed looking at the art on view, but its sleek glass walls were extremely reverberant, far from ideal for engaged listening. So Pooch and I considered other spaces, including the National Gallery of Modern Art, which you'll see on the left side. Uh, the same architectural conditions existed everywhere that we looked in Delhi. Hard surfaces, glass, marble, concrete. Interior resonance was the integral to the soundscape of India. Then a few weeks later, you'll remember this picture from before. A few weeks later, I was at the movies. I actually was at the, or if there's any Bollywood fans here, I was at the Umrao John remake at the PVR theater in Sackett. So I had a flash of realization that there was in fact a space in India that was acoustically dry and designed to play back recorded sound in high fidelity. And it was not a single unique location, but rather a network of theaters. Within the cinema, there were no open windows. There were no marble floors. There was no reverb and glass walls. Cinemas were secular temples and they were everywhere and they were a perfect place to present this survey show of sound art that Pooja wanted. So with the mandate from Coach to produce a sound art group show at a movie theater, um, Lauren and I formed Audience in New York as an organization devoted to exploring the cinema as a new presentation venue for sound art. Um, the initial invitation from Coach came in, the, in November 2006, and by the fall of 2007, Lauren and I had issued a call for multi-channel works that would be formatted to 5.1 surround sound, and we rented a theater in Manhattan in which to listen to the pieces that we printed a DVD in order to make our final selections for the show. And there we were sitting in the sweet spot of the theater, and that was when we first experienced uh, our first roadblock, which is that a DVD the DVD player did not connect to the cinema's surround sound system. It was only playing works in stereo. The only way to connect to the surround amplifier was via the film projector, which would decode the Dolby optical soundtrack that's printed on the margins of the 35 millimeter film strip. And this was our first exposure to the wall of proprietary technology that separates the cinema system from the wild west of new media. So this picture here that you'll see, this is actually a picture from 2014. This is a movie theater in Miami. Um, and I just picked this so you could see a, a theater that has both um, a 35 millimeter projector and a cinema projector. So those two boxes on either side of the, the two gray boxes there are both 35 millimeter projectors and the middle black box is a digital projector. So in 2007, the transition to digital cinema was not yet complete. Digital Cinema Initiatives, which was a creation of the seven major Hollywood studios, um, was still finalizing the digital cinema package. That is the file format protocol that now, can now all digital cinemas are encoded in, which has replaced uh, film as a distribution media. Digital cinema hardware had not yet replaced film projectors in most major cinemas. And so to play sounds in a cinema, it seemed like we had to make a film. So that is its own long story that we also tell in the chapter in, in Indian sound cultures, um, but I'll skip that for now. And Alexis, I think you just muted yourself. Oh, there we no, go. You're back. Yeah, I, I didn't. Yeah. Did it, you do that on happened. purpose? I'm sorry. Okay. No, I did not. I, I didn't do it. I was wondering what happened. <laughs> so anyway, um, that what we... We, I'm going to skip that part. And then at last in 2012, I'm trying to, there we go. 
At last in 2012, there was funding available for Coach um, to have us do the sound art show. And instead of staging a survey of contemporary sound art, which was the original idea, Pooja suggested that we present soundscapes of India from phonographers and composers. So we issued a call for 5.1 surround sound works that directly represented the unique soundscapes, rural, rural, and media-based of the Indian subcontinent. Um, we also set up two submission themes. One was soundscapes, which is what I'll be playing uh, for you today, and Bollywood in the dark. So the artist names here. So the artists that we had in the show, in the selections, were Ian Armstrong, uh, his work Annapurna Pastoral, Ujwal Utkarsh, who had a work that was about train stations called Yatra, Michael Northam's um, mnemonic debris aggregates. Uh, there was a small stereo phonograph from Rax Media Collective called New Delhi Junction. Buddha Ditya Chattopadhyay's work, whose title I can't remember right now, um, and Diffuse Beats, um, which is a collaborative of Ishravat and uh, did Sonic City and Kamal Swaroop is a film director. We played his film Om Darbadar and we played Into the Labyrinth by Hildegard Westerkamp. So I'm going to talk about all these pieces now a little bit. So Listen My Heart is a collection of soundscapes that integrates two important trajectories of sound art, acoustic ecology and cinema por lore. Um, the Soundscape is really the subject and the compositional form of acoustic ecology. In soundscape, we can think of as a double term, like landscape, which if you think about a landscape means both the world itself, the, the landscape, uh, and it's also a composition that represents this view of the world itself. So soundscape is similar as both the sound that surrounds us and a compositional representation of the sound around us. So acoustic ecology emerged in Canada through the work of R. Murray Schaefer and his collaborators at the World Soundscape Project. And both the scientific discipline and the foundation for a new compositional practice, acoustic ecology studies the relationship between living beings and their environment as mediated through sound. The idea of soundscape emerged perhaps in 1930 when German filmmaker Walter Rittmann produced Weekend, a collage of recorded words, musical fragments, and ambient recordings that told the story of a weekend trip to the country. This movie without images produced a narrative based, upon, based on the mental images projected by the sounds alone. <clears throat> it was, in other words, the first cinema for the ear. The Soviet filmmaker Giga Vertov followed the next year with enthusiasm, the most ambitious field recording work of its time. In the 1990s, Cinema Pour Lore emerged as a francophone tradition rooted in the work of Pierre Schaeffer and the GRM, the pioneering tape compositions of Luc Ferrari, and the acoustic acousmatic music of Francis Domon and Robert Normandot, as well as the theory and sound design of Michel Chion. Uh, Cinema Pour Lore prioritized multi-channel audio diffusion and Schaefer's concept of reduced listening. Uh, it avoided and rejected sonic representation, exploring sound as an object in itself, independent of source and medium. As Brandon LaBelle suggested in Background Noise, the soundscapes of Hildegard Westerkamp, whose work was included in Listen My Heart, bridge this Schaefer, as in Murray Schaefer, Schaefer divide. Uh, so Murray Schaefer, Pierre Schaefer, divide between representation and abstraction, harnessing the real while getting closer to its submerged sonority, in the words of Brandon LaBelle. So Listen My Heart drew together these two traditions of acoustic ecology and cinema pour lore into a phonographic journey that begins high in the Himalayas at the sacred shrine of Muktinath with its hundred springs of water. From these Himalayan peaks, the water of the Yam... Did you read this at the beginning, Scott? Did you read this text? <laughs> I, I did. I slightly altered it, though. So why okay. don't you go ahead and read I'll it read anyway? It yeah. So <clears throat> Listen My Heart draws together these traditions of acoustic ecology into a phonographic journey that begins high in the Himalayas at the sacred shrine of Muktinath with its hundred springs of water. From the Himalayan peaks, the water of the Yamna flows down to the plains, and listeners can slowly follow the waters in, Annapurna, in Ian Armstrong's Annapurna Pastoral or hop on the train in Ujwal Utkarsh is Yatra, jumping off at the Rax Media Collective's New Delhi Junction. If you're stuck in Delhi traffic, Michael Northam's aggregates will transform the noise. 
Buddhaditya Chattopadhyay's The Well-Tempered City, Book One, transports the listeners into an abstracted city of sound, while Hildegard Westerkamp's Into the Labyrinth leads them through it. And Diffuse Beats' Sonic City folds the sounds of Delhi into the streets of Zurich over a rhythmic beat in search of the Ur sound of an Ur city without border guards or police. And finally, Kamal Swoop invites listeners to experience the dreams of a boy named Om. So those were the seven works that we presented in 2013 um, in New Delhi. Do I have a picture here? No, I'm gonna go back to one of these pictures of, of uh, so this is the, the, the day of the screening. So we had a little, um, if you see on the left there, the titles are, are in front of each theater. We like took over this whole multiplex. Um, and you know, you would come in and the, every screen was only sound installations and um, and you could just go in and it was a black screen. So for it was about three hours. No, it was only an hour and 15 minutes. Oh my goodness. Um, you would be able to go in and just listen to works. So, um, and this is the projector booth on the right. That's uh, Annie Root, who's the projectionist. So, um, okay, so works and descriptions. So, What's our time? How's our time, Scott? I can't see it while I'm on the thing. We're at 7.24 right now. 7.24. Okay, so I'm not going to read any descriptions, and I'm just going to jump right into hearing a little bit. So I'm going to play two pieces here for my wonderful Canadian audience. We're going to play Hildegard Westerkamp. Um, but first, we're going to play Ian Armstrong's Annapurna Pastoral, um, which was published by New Adventures in Sound Art um, in, I think, 2009. So that's what we'll start with. And it's, we're, I'll just play for about five minutes. It starts quietly.
we're not hearing you right now, Alexis, even though we heard your sound. I think you're maybe your mic needs to come down. There we go. I just skipped ahead so we can hear the water. Yeah. Okay, I'll just leave that on the background, but there you have the water. Um, and now I can read a description. So Ian describes Annapurna Pastoral 100 Springs as a meditation on the soundscapes of the Annapurna, the high peaks region of the Himalayas in, the central, in central Nepal. It's a loose narrative of pilgrimage to Muktinath also known as the 100 Springs. The work aims to capture the peaceful pastoral nature of these remote locations while representing the deep, the deep rooted spiritualism that the Himalayas inspire. Subverted references to the musical pastoral can be heard through the sounds of the Bansuri, Sarangi and drones. The composition itself is 15 minutes. I played for you the first three minutes and then I jumped ahead um, to about 7.30 and we're at about 10 minutes now. Um, it begins and ends with a Tibetan singing bowl acting like a kind of a transporter or a landing site into a world of bells. The principal sound sources were recorded by the artist during a trek around Annapurna in 2007 and include mostly mule trains with their bells, ambient sounds of birds, insects, and water. Um, 
the Mani prayer wheels, which is what you're hearing right now in, um, in Manang, and the bells and springs at Muktinath. Right before you heard the water, there were all those bells, and that was the entrance of the temple at Muktinath. Composed primarily with straight field recordings modified only by delays, the rhythms are based on walking to the measure of footsteps. It is a human-sized composition and an experience of telepresence. So that was Ian's. The next one I want to play a sample of is Hildegard Westerkamp's Into the Labyrinth. So this is another 15-minute piece, and I'm going to play again five minutes and then describe the work. Does that sound good? Am I still muted, Scott? Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you now. Yeah, you just okay, had to before. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm turning down Hildegard's piece, but I'm going to share links for everybody to hear these. Um, I've just been listening just now with you all to this little stereo track. And I have to tell you that I had the pleasure of hearing this work in the movie theater six times. And it's it was so rich to hear it in surround sound and like he, comparing this little stereo recording to the experience of hearing it in the movie theater is part of why we created audience because um because this is really just a little snapshot that you're getting so um here's a work description from hildegard um hildegard describes into the labyrinth which was has dates of 2000 and 2012 as a sonic journey between dream and reality into the indian culture and the indian soundscape um, originally commissioned by New Adventures in Sound Art in Toronto, the work premiered as an eight-channel composition at the Gibraltar Point Art Centre on Toronto Island in 2000. 
In 2012, Hildegard created a 5.1 surround sound version, especially for Listen My Heart. Uh, the sources for this work were recorded between 1992 and 1998 in Delhi, Rajasthan, Goa, and Rishikesh, and include voices, musicians, ambient sounds, um, including traffic, animals, films, and recorded music. This 15-minute work, Into the Labyrinth, was the most musical of all the works that were presented in Listen My Heart, with expert field recordings of musical performances. Westerkamp's beautiful capturing of temple bells and train horns were used as sonic archetypes of India's also marked it, at least to some of the listeners in Delhi, as a little bit Orientalist. Um, the response to the piece was also divided along generational lines. Uh, for a lot of the older listeners, it was a really nostalgic experience for them to hear these old recordings of Delhi in the 90s. And younger listeners in 21st century Delhi were incredulous that these recordings were made in the capital city. Um, given the rapid social and technological changes in India since 1995, Western Camp source recordings actually offer an important sound archive that deserves preservation and deeper listening. Um, we got to meet a couple of the people who helped make her recordings in the 90s when she had her trip to India, and they were really enthusiastic to, um, to hear the work. So that's it for the samples that I'm going to play, um, and I'll share the links. So just to close before we get into questions, what is next? Um, I want to talk about two things about what's next. So as I mentioned, this show, Listen My Heart, happened in 2013. And the reason I'm talking about it is because I have this new book that came out. Um, but so the two things that are new um, since Listen My Heart happened are 3D sound and the future development of sound art in India since Listen My Heart happened. So first to talk about 3D sound briefly, cinema sound platforms have undergone seismic shifts since the complete transition to digital cinema. Um, a few months before Listen My Heart premiered in June of 2012, Dolby released Atmos, which brought a third atmospheric dimension to the immersive uh, sound experiences and forecast the potential demise of what is now called channel-based mixing. Uh, Atmos featured up to 128 discrete audio tracks sent to an array of speakers around and over the audience. Atmos enabled a greater specificity in sound design since engineers can assign any sounds to any particular point in space rather to a finite number of speaker channels. So these object-based audio technologies like Atmos and its competitors, Oro 3D and Wavefield Synthesis, have remained somewhat accessible to audiences in the US and India. While the technology was swiftly embraced by the Indian film community, only a small number of theaters in major cities have installed Atmos, and atmospheric sound mixing remains unaffordable for most film presentations. You know what? This is all in my chapter. You can read it and agree with it or disagree with it. Um, hopefully, there are people on this call at the Sound Studies Institute who know more about what is going on in 3D sound, because this is from a text that I wrote two years ago. And Lauren and I are very curious about what's going on with 3D sound, especially in terms of room-sized applications and not just headphone-based applications. Most of the interesting artists who we've worked with, or sorry, most of the artists we've worked with in audience who are doing interesting things with 3D sound are working in a headphone environment. And we're just not sure who's really working in the room environment or thinking about 3D sound as a distribution, like distribution formats of 3D sound. But so the other um, takeaway future point to bring is just about um, sound art in India. So listen my heart, this whole original invitation happened because Koj wanted to introduce Indian audiences to sound art. And I just wanna mention that the field flourishes in India now. And um, in Chennai, the electronic artist Yash Shetty hosts international sound artists for residencies every year at the Indian Sonic Research Organization, where they work with a collective of instrument builders and with students at the Shristi Institute. Art critics at major Indian newspapers are all familiar with sound art. They regularly review sound installations, see how often that happens in North America. Um, and artist Shilpa Gupta won the 2019 India Today New Media Artist Award for this installation here for In Your Tongue, I Cannot Hide. Uh, this work premiered at the Edinburgh Art Festival in 2017, I think, and then it came, or in 2018, and then it came to the 2018 Kochi Mortis Biennial. Um, the Biennial itself was curated by a coach founding member, Anita Dubey. 
and mobilized film, sound, installation, and performance as a way of rejecting a world mediated primarily through images, a society of the spectacle. Uh, the Sound Reasons Festival, which was founded in Kirkigown just up the street from Koj, has produced six international sound art and experimental music festivals in Delhi since 2012. And in short, India has emerged as a key site for global discourse on sound art, and I think it's thanks in no small part to Koj's concerted efforts and their indirect influence. So that was the last point I want to raise about the future, but now I want to turn the conversation back to you and find out what you all think about these works and um, what you might know about 3D sound. And just a reminder, we have this book that has just come out that you should check out and, um, and let us know if there's any future for audience. We've been on hiatus since 2016. If you wanna help write the next chapter after Q&A, you could take down my phone number right there and give me a call as well if you have ideas about the future. And now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. How do I do that right there? Um, so th thank you so much. That was a great presentation. And um, just in order to, and by the way, I have a million questions. So Alexis, one of the things that's really fascinating to me about your project um, is uh, it's something that is a real interest of mine, um, which has to do with what I was, what I have called the crisis of venue for multi-channel works. Yeah. And so, uh, and I've, I've written a bit about this and, and uh, thought a lot about it and had to deal with it um, a lot. And just for those who, uh, who don't know the history of this, as, as Alexis points out, multi-channel sound or you know more than two speakers and the ability to, to spatialize sound um, has been with us for a long time. Um, but there's never been a widespread um, kind of standardization for um, playing multi-channel sound, except in film. And, and indeed, um, as Alexa says, film theaters throughout the world are actually already equipped to do multi-channel sound. Um, so this is such a cool idea and, uh, and it, it opens up all kinds of really neat possibilities for bringing this work to people who don't otherwise, wouldn't otherwise hear it and to be able to hear it in a really ideal situation. So one of my questions is um, having to do, well, I'll start with, a, with just the basic question about um, some of the assumptions that, that are made about multi-channel sound. Um, so I know that, for example, um, when, when I'm working on a multi-channel piece, for example, or I have a student working on something or whatever, we, we have a lot of conversations about um, where the sweet spot is and, and how to arrange the speakers in such a way that all the voices are, are being given um, equal measure in terms of their spatiality and stuff like that. Um, and so there's some kind of best practices that we talk about in terms of speaker arrangement. And one of the things I know about 5.1 systems in, in film is that they're not actually organized that way. They are, they are but the, the placement, um, the, the, G, the physical placement of the speakers is not actually, um, it, it does, it, there's sort of different, um, different characteristics because of the way in which the back speakers are normally used by um, film. In, in films and also the way the center speaker is used. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit about just the translation factor. Um, uh, and because I'm sure that on the one hand, many of the artists were probably super pleased to be able to present their work in a place that um, is outfitted with multi-channel sound. On the other hand, there may have been some surprises um, in terms of the way in which things, um, like where things came from physically in the space and, and also how uh, dealing with the subwoofer, the, the low bass frequencies and stuff like that. So I wondered if you wanted to just talk about a little bit about what some of the strategies were for dealing with those things if you had to deal with them. Well, um, that's a fine question. Um, a lot of the dealing with it would have happened for composers and dependent on how they were doing it in their own studios. Uh, I can say that Laura and I, you know, we had, we curated five or six shows and the quality of submissions and the quality of surround mixing improved every year as we did the shows. And we got the feeling that part of it had to do with the preview rooms um, of the people who were sending works. You know, we were getting um, a, a lot of works were from recent graduates or people who were teachers, and it seemed like um, it seemed like the the facilities that they had were were improving. But I have a couple of stories about 
um, surprises that happen, which mostly have to do with just the ways that cinemas don't get standardized. So um, at the Block Museum, for example, which has great sound and is a beautiful theater, um, they have this like, um, they have this framework for acoustic tile in the top, like, you know, the steel frame, but the acoustic tiles aren't in every spot, you know, so you can see up above, it has this sort of look. And so uh, there were some points where there was heavy, but Michael Northam's piece had really heavy bass. And so the whole framework would just rattle <laughs> along with it, you know, and so uh, there was something to do about it, you know, so, um, and um, uh, otherwise, you know, things were pretty, you know, they, they were pretty much just like an enlarged, I mean, the, the translate, so Listen My Heart, we mixed that in this little dinky little um, digital editing studio that like did, they, they did DCP packaging for film trailers, you know, and so like their, you know, their preview room was like this tiny thing, we only had, like, we barely got to hear, you know, what we heard, it was like very different than in New York, we would always listen to the pieces at Harvest Works. We'd spend like all day calibrating the room to like listen to anything. And then we were at the theater in Delhi, you know, it was, it was really small. And yet it it did pretty much just enlarge, you know, it was just a, it was very much just an enlarged version. The, I mean, the standardization effect is real. There, there are bad architectural installations, you know, there's places where the speakers are just in utterly the wrong place. But when they're done correctly, um, it really is just like blowing up the sound into to fill a bigger room, and it, and it sounds in a, a very similar way to the way it would always sound in the preview room. I, I was um, I was generally um, amazed by the consistency of that experience. So, well, I also just want to echo your um, uh, the, the the experience you had um, hearing Hildegard's piece in in multi channel because that piece, I mean. Uh, that that's a piece that's pretty well known and I played a lot for my classes but we yeah. always listen to the stereo version obviously but I did get a chance to hear an eight channel version of it once and it does as you said it just transforms the piece it's such a different experience to be able to hear it in multi-channel was anyone here did anyone here um experience the original uh eight channel piece um in Toronto Island at Gibraltar point don't see any <laughs> no Emmanuel Oh, maybe no. No, um, unfortunately, yeah, so, I wasn't there. Uh, so that was a great story. Um, yeah, Hildegard got the call, and she said, um, "I think it was Barry, uh, is who she's one of her close um, collaborators. I, I think Barry um, was working in in five point one um, editing, and said that he would take on the task of of making a five point one version, or I think it was a seven point one version originally uh, out of the." Um, the eight channel piece. So through some new, some new plugin that he had just gotten and I want to try it out. <laughs> so that was wonderful. Any other questions? I mean, I have another one, but I, I'd I have to... one. Um, although it's a little tangential, but so um, uh, Alexis, there was, you were commissioned to do it in, in this in India, right? Yeah. It was yeah, invited to. Uh, I'm just I just think it's interesting that um, I think theaters in India are an interesting place for this kind of thing because it seems to me that that sound is so central to Bollywood movies. So it, it's it's strikes me as as those theaters would have moved to this kind of 3D audio more quickly than some other places or something. Is that true or or what's your experience with that? Kind of thing. Well, so um, when we wrote this chapter, we were looking at what happened with um, 3D, 3D audio adoption. So all the studios adopted 3D audio right away. And two of the first 10 movies that were produced in Atmos were, um, were Indian films. Um, so you could say it's 20%. Of, but you know, I mean, I don't know how it once you get into the first 200, I don't know if they're still at 20%, but they did um, adopt it right away. But the rollout in the halls has been slower. Um, I, I don't know how, I, I mean, right now we're in 2020 where the whole cinema, the future of cinema is just like in jeopardy practically, you know, and, and very uncertain, which is why it's like an exciting moment for me to 
I, I know I got really excited to talk about audience and think about audience again because the future of cinema is so uncertain. Um, and I feel like that's a time when the barriers erected by proprietary technology can sort of make new new um, ladders over the walls of the, of the, those barriers. But um, so yeah, I, I, the only answer I have is like from two years ago. I, I don't know the, the current status, but there was quick adoption from the cinemas, from the studios, but because the cinemas have been slow to roll out 3D sound, um, it's usually just an additional option. It's not the, films are still being primarily produced in 5.1, so. Uh, okay, um, I have another question, but I'm gonna I'm gonna see if anyone else has a question before me. Just pipe right in with your question if if you have one. I I could maybe ask a question about um, I was I was uh, Emmanuel here from Montreal. Hi everyone. Um, I uh, was my interest was really piqued when you talked about uh, like that experience of the. Um, the DVD not talking to the to the sound system and and you you sort of describe that as the first or an early ro roadblock in sort of a series mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if like generally speaking the whole the, the the litany of roadblocks were all technical or if there was things maybe to do more with um, uh, the aesthetics of of the of the proposal. No, I mean, the biggest roadblock was the global financial collapse in 2008. I mean, oh, we yeah. started this right. show in November 2007. It was going to be, you know, it was, um, I think it was going to happen originally in March 2009. And, you know, uh, it just didn't happen. And Lauren and I um, did ver just started doing different things um, in 2009. And, um, but so there was a series of roadblocks in the very beginning at that time, which was back in 2007, 2008. And so again, that was all before the digital cinema package was like completed and completely rolled out. And when there was, we were still in this moment of transition when you would, when most theaters would have both a film projector and a digital projector, when there were still projectionists working. Um, and so the, the previous way that you would connect to the surround sound system was through the, the Dolby film, and then that would get decoded. And so it took us a while to work. There were a couple of technical snags we had that had to do with getting around needing to make a film. And we were lucky to have um, someone at Dolby New York um, just sort of help us find the way to it involved buying like a box from them a dma 8 plus decoder um, which would then we can make into a tour kit with a blu-ray but that would get us around and you need to print a film and would let us um talk to the cinema surround system directly so this but it, problem they, this problem that you're describing um is a real one uh it's one that i in which is just the problem of the Dolby system being a closed system, they don't really want you to be able to extract the audio and do and route it around and you know to right. your own. And uh, so it's and, and you know it's funny because the 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 box you mentioned, I have I also have a little box that I you have a I DMA bought. eight plus. No no no, it's no. a different <laughs> it's a different manufacturer. But I I understand why you got excited because they're actually really hard to find. Um, right. Dolby doesn't actually want people to be able to buy these things. Mm -hmm. Um, I have it because I need to be able to extract 5.1 audio from game systems and then send it into more arbitrary systems because I'm just doing a lot of work with with 3D sound. So I, the, I'm going to turn this into a question about the uh, the Atmos uh, stuff. And I know you may not know this, and maybe somebody in the audience does, but my curious curiosity about that or concern about it really is that it. it I don't know if it's using ambisonics as a as a mode for for doing the extraction, which is probably what it's doing. But my my worry is that it will also be a closed system, uh, and uh, at the same time, there are all of these really great ambisonic systems out there for doing multi-channel audio, as you know, right. in homes and stuff. And it's being used in gaming, and it's it's a huge thing. And so I'm just curious if there's been any, I don't know, attempts to kind of try to harmonize the you know the the need in the industry to do this kind of thing with the 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 need of artists to be able to access these things in a 
in a meaningful way. And I don't know if you, if you know the answer to that, but it's just an interesting I, problem. I don't know. And I want to know, I, I want to know, I mean, here in Troy, you know, they were having, they were having an annual um, surround sound symposium every summer. It was canceled this year, you know, but um, it was really great to get perspectives on, on from all over the world uh, about just how uncertain the future of 3D sound is. You know, I mean, you can read the, you can read the, PR materials from Dolby or from Aura 3D, but you know neither of those systems are fully standardized yet as far as like what the cinemas are adopting and, um, and and artists are just working with ambisonics on their own. And wave field synthesis is an interesting thing that lots of people are experimenting with, you know, but which has um, which has unpredictable results at times, you know. And so it's also not its own. It's, it's it has its own um, problems for its adoption. So anyway, I'd love to know what anybody here might know about it. I, again, I feel like I'm two years, two years behind in the latest with 3D sound, so. Um, all right, well, I'm not hearing anyone <laughs> getting in with a lot of information, so that's okay. Um, I will say um, just maybe one of the last things is just the, the thing about wave field synthesis um, that, that is a fascinating piece of technology. I did get a chance to play with it, it at the impact space um, when they were doing those workshops. And it, it certainly, the use cases for it are very different um, in the sense that um, it's not really a sweet spot oriented way of doing multi-channel sound. It's more of you moving through sound physically. Um, and it's extremely powerful though. Um, and my thinking is that it will be, um, I think, particularly interesting to see how that, how that develops in the, the AR VR world where um, folks who are interested in VR but doing it in a real space where people can actually move around whether you're tethered or not, but like being able to actually like ambulate around a space in, in augmented reality. I think wave field, wave field synthesis has a huge potential for that, but it's also, extremely expensive and very you have to highly control the space to make it work as you know but anyway it's just it's an exciting development i'm looking forward to seeing what emerges with that so um well we're at a little bit after eight now and unless there are any other burning questions um i just want to thank you so much for your talk tonight this has been really fantastic and if everyone is able to unmute themselves let's have a little a little bit of Thank Zoom you. applause here, and uh, it'd be great to see your faces, too, everyone. If you can, if you can turn your cameras on for a second, and we can all say hello to each other. Yay! Oh, oh hey, yes. hi, everybody! Real people out there. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, if there's no other questions or comments, um, did you send people the link to the book? Oh yes, absolutely. Hey, and um, let me. Um, Laura on and I are only website. one chapter. There's yeah. uh, there's eleven other chapters to check out. So and we, we will also <laughs> order a copy of we'll also order a copy of that for our library. So um, the university community can check it out in that way. Um, so uh, but I just invite everybody to check the website in a couple of days once we've updated it uh, the lecture series page and we'll add those links in there. Tom has also just put um, the link to the book in the chat. So if you want to grab it really quick, do that now and check it out and it should be really fun to to see and hear and thanks again for this great talk um and uh have a great evening everyone yeah. one more one more time thank you scott thanks scott thanks, thanks, thanks you alberta Johnny, <laughs> Dom. hope i get to come back to edmonton someday 